the last call of that legal contract, the iconic cuckoo, which was known as the Kunst and Kulturcentrum in Kreuzberg, was cleared in July 1984. Despite the brief flourishing of an open air squat in a strip of uh, no man's land west of the wall, um, right here, it was only with the fall of the Berlin Wall that the second wave of squatting was able to revive the senior districts of former East Berlin. And this is a remarkable moment just before the fall of, of, of the wall in 89. Um, and when the wall was actually um, put up in 61, some of, some of its territory that it demarcated on the west of the wall actually legally belonged to the German Democratic Republic. Um, what's interesting is that in the summer of 1988, some of that land was going to be given back to East Germany. And just before that moment, uh, a number of squatters squatted in this, this legal no man's land between West and East. And when the police came to, uh, to clear them out, there's this remarkable image of them using ladders to cross over from West Berlin into East Berlin, where um, uh, officials picked them up, they were processed, and then they returned um, to uh, West Berlin. Oh. Anyway, so that's just part. That, that, that's just this part of the, the story about um, this particular moment um, where 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 you have this sort of remarkable open air squat. But I think what's also interesting in the story is how the hard lessons of the 1980s had, in many ways, been learned by many of the squatters who would then take up uh, uh, squatting in the 1990s. Notwithstanding the images of those massive protests that I showed already from Mainzerstrasse in November 1990, more pragmatic form of negotiation was being taken on board by activists keen on reconciling these tensions between institutional political structures and practical forms of self-rule. So squatting for many of them now demanded a trade-off between existing political institutions and new insurgent forms of citizenship, though it would be misleading to conflate realistic political ambitions with a sense of diminished commitment. The very task of living the political simply demanded for many of the, uh, the squatters a form of activism that attempted to balance claims for self-determination with broader participation in local politics. Now, the story that I've been telling so far, it, it, uh, one other way of beginning to tell the story, and something that I'm interested in, is that it represents also the latest episode in the social life of a particular architectural form, namely the Berlin Tenement House or Meets House. Now, this was a uh, architectural form that was first conceived in the late 18th century by the Prussian king Frederick II to house soldiers and their families. And the biography of the Berliner Meets House was itself intimately tied to successive rounds of creative destruction from at least the middle of the 19th century. Um, many commentators, uh, many historical commentators, have singled out the Holbrook plan. This is probably the worst map <laughs> ever. Fortunately, I need to get, get a, a better copy from the Berlin Archive. But this was a, a, an urban plan produced in 1862, and it's often understood by historians of the city to represent a key moment in the transformation of the city in the second half of the 19th century. It, as the extension plan for the city of, uh, of Berlin, <coughs> this plan, which was drawn up by an inexperienced engineer, focused on the circulation of traffic and future development outside the built-up core of the city. The final result was a vast and regularized grid of city blocks that were linked to existing roads and property lines. One could think of this in some ways as the equivalent uh, of, 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 for Berlin of, of house urbanization for Paris. And when state officials in Berlin attempted to regulate the acquisition of land as, as a product of this particular plan, though land speculation boom soon ensued as landowners sought to maximize windfall profits. And the result was the construction of massive tenement blocks traditionally five stories high um, that extend to the back of the lot and are only broken up by a series of tiny courtyards that could be as narrow as 15 feet, minimum necessary to comply with fire regulations. Poor living conditions, disease, and overcrowding were commonplace. What's also interesting is that the story of this particular architectural form also carried with it a sedimented historical geography of protest. So from riots over the provision of housing in the 1860s and 1870s, to widespread rent strikes in the early 1930s. And I think there were actually, um, these rent strikes carried on um, in the period from 33 to 45 as well. Now, the stigma surrounding crowded apartment blocks were also intensified during the war as inner courtyards quickly became death traps in times of aerial bombardment. And yet, where a first generation of post war planners saw the widespread demolition of these tenements as a much needed solution to a pressing housing crisis, squatters would later come to see the buildings in the light of the creative possibilities they offered. Um, the historian Brian uh, Ladd writes that a hallmark of the Meats House or Meats Caserne is its flexibility. 
the many dilapidated and decaying um, Reitz Kazan in a post war Berlin offered the potential for squatters to cultivate new forms of, of sociality and in so doing reconcile, I would argue, a ruinous artifact of urban modernity with the alternate expression of human coll collectivity. For the former squatter and now architect Dougal Sheridan, the task of improving or repairing these old buildings rely on a large degree of collective action and decision making. And often the material circumstances of abandoned buildings meant that the rules of occupancy, DIY maintenance, and regeneration were fluid, and that the division and distribution of spaces and facilities was not predetermined. And what squatters did were really to respond to the normative assumptions, the, 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 the typical assumptions about living and the home through the questioning of its more basic geographies. And again, this took on a number of forms, and in the wider project, I, I try to track the different spatial practices uh, of squatters in this period. Of course, at the most rudimentary level, I think what architecture served here was really as a guiding frame for the breakdown of that traditional public-private divide and the prioritization of different forms of communal space. Through, and what's interesting is Sheridan's managed to sort of map this out through his own experience with the squat um, at Berlinstrasse 6 7 um, in Prenzlauer Berg in the mid 1990s. And what he does here is really highlight the complex gradations of private and public space that were often made possible by the existing building structure. Um, here, the permeability of the building was increased and manipulated to suit the changing needs of squatters. Walls were removed in order to increase the size of social spaces, while stairwells were created, producing new geography and movement through the building, now connected and held together by an interspatial network of doors, passageways, courtyards, and vestibules. In other instances, more trenchant forms of occupation were mobilized. The former chocolate factory of the firm Kreisel and Dobritz at Marianenstrasse 6 in Kreuzberg was squatted in 1981 by a group of women who, and I quote, were looking for rooms where they could live undisturbed and meet freely with each other without the unwanted attention of men, without being restricted solely to their own private apartments or the routinizing spatial demands of domesticity and social reproduction. Renovation and modernization of the shoko fabric shown here was undertaken by the occupants themselves, and it really focused on a process of participatory architecture and sustainable redevelopment. And this is an early example of the kind of sort of environmentally friendly, if you like, sustainable redevelopment that has become a commonplace among much of the, the squatting scene in Berlin. And it's interesting in a number of interviews I've done is that while a number of the squatters and former squatters reflected positively on the ways in which they were able to forge an emotional field of commitment and solidarity, they also drew attention to the negative consequences. They just talk about the grind of shared living. And in the words of one former squatter, life was often difficult. There were tears and some comrades and principles had to be left behind. Um, the model to live and work together led to a delicate balancing act between happiness and emotional breakdown. 